Hi everybody, this is video two of chapter five from your operating systems book. In this video we're going to cover chapter five, section three of your operating systems textbook on semaphores. We'll talk about, or actually I'm going to refer you to a table in your book that gives a breakdown and a very basic description of several common concurrency mechanisms. And then we'll talk about semaphores, what they are, the difference between strong and weak semaphores, some examples, and a, a look at an implementation. How do we implement semaphores? So here is that table that I promised you. This is table 5.3, and it appears on page 214 of your operating systems textbook. Uh, for the purposes of this video, pays uh, most attention to semaphores and binary semaphores, but take a look at the rest of these, understand these terms, understand the definitions of these terms, because a lot of them will be very important throughout the discussion of the rest of this chapter and moving forward. So let's and once again, go ahead and pause the video, open up the book, take a look at these, and make sure you understand what this table is telling you. So the fundamental principle of semaphores is this. Two or more processes can commute, cooperate by means of simple signals so that a process can be forced to stop at a specified place until it receives a specified signal. Any complex coordination requirement can be satisfied by the appropriate structure of signals. For signaling, special variables called semaphores are used. To transmit a signal via semaphore S, a process executes the primitive sem signal S. So it's the sem signal command and we pass the parameter S, which is our semaphore variable. To receive a signal via semaphore S, a process executes the primitive sem wait. If the corresponding signal has not yet been transmitted, the process is suspended until the transmission takes place. So to achieve this effect, we can view the semaphore as a variable that has an integer value upon which only three operations are defined. It can be initialized to a non-negative integer value. The sem wait operation decrements the value. So if the value becomes negative, the process executing the sem wait function is blocked. Otherwise, the process continues its execution. The sem signal operation increments the semaphore value. So if the resulting value is less than or equal to zero, then a process blocked by a sem wait operation, if there are any, is unblocked. Other than those three operations, there's no way to inspect or manipulate semaphores. So I do want to go back really quick and just uh, mention when we use sem signal and we increment the semaphore value, if it's if the semaphore is at a negative value, that means that there are processes waiting. There are processes that have been blocked. So the if it's negative, the negative number gives us a count of how many processes are blocked and waiting for the go ahead, the signal to continue operation. So if we have negative three, we issue a sem signal, and that increments it to negative two. That means that there were three processes waiting that were blocked and waiting to execute. We take one of those and allow it to continue execution, getting it out of the blocked state. So this method of defining semaphores leads to some interesting consequences, uh, specifically about some things that we don't know and can't predict when we're using semaphores. Uh, in general, there's no way to know before a process decrements a semaphore whether it's going to block or not. Uh, after a process increments a semaphore and another process gets woken up, both processes continue running concurrently, and there's no way to know which process, if either, is going to continue immediately on a uniprocessor system. So it could be one of those two processes, or it could swap out to a completely different process. And when you signal a semaphore, you don't necessarily know whether another process is waiting, so the number of unblocked processes may be zero or one. Now, we use a queue to hold processes that are waiting on the semaphore. And the difference between strong and weak semaphores just has to do with how we're going to determine which blocked process are we going to remove from the queue first. With a strong semaphore, we just use a simple first in, first out approach. So the process that's been blocked the longest is released from the queue first. With weak semaphores, that just means we don't specify an order in which processes are removed from the queue. 
So let's take a look at an example of the operation of a strong semaphore. In this example, processes A, B, and C depend on a result from process D. Initially, A is running, and B, C, and D are ready, and the semaphore count is 1, indicating that one of D's results is available. When A issues a semweight instruction on semaphore S, the semaphore decrements to 0, and A can continue to execute. Subsequently, it times out, its time slice expires, and it rejoins the ready queue. Then B runs, eventually issues a semweight instruction, and is blocked, allowing D to run. When D completes a new result, it issues a sem signal instruction, which allows B to move to the ready queue. D rejoins the ready queue, and C begins to run, but is blocked when it issues a semweight instruction. Similarly, A and B run and are blocked on the semaphore, allowing D to resume execution. When D has a result, it issues a sem signal, which transfers C to the ready queue. And then this continues, and later cycles of D will release A and B from the blocked state. Now, as you work your way through this example, please note that, as we mentioned a couple slides ago, the number of processes in the blocked queue corresponds to the negative value of semaphore S. Now, let's take a look at this in another way. So let's assume that we have a critical resource or a critical region of code that's protected by a semaphore called lock. And so on the left side of this, we're going to have the queue for the semaphore lock, and this is the queue that includes processes that have been blocked. The value of semaphore lock is the next thing to the right here. And then we take a look at the execution of processes A, B, and C as they execute and in turn try to gain access to that critical resource. So the value of the semaphore, called lock, is initialized to 1, and all three processes can run doing what they're doing until they try to access that critical region. Now eventually, process A issues a semweight, and so it's basically asking for access to that critical section of code so it can access that critical resource, which decrements the value of the semaphore to zero, but everything can keep running because A is the first process that's asked for access, so it's given access right away, and all three processes keep on running. Now eventually, process B issues a semweight. It wants to access that critical region, and the value of lock is decremented to negative one, and B now has to block because A hasn't released it. There's been no sem signal from A saying, okay, I've cleared the critical region, now somebody else can get a turn. So B gets blocked and added to the semaphore queue. Uh, eventually, process C also issues a semweight, trying to get access to the critical region, which decrements the value of semaphore lock to minus two, and C gets added to that blocked queue. The next thing we take a look at is, finally, set, process A is done with the critical region, so it issues a sem signal saying, okay, I'm done, somebody else can have a chance now, which increments the value of lock to negative one, allowing B to exit the blocked queue and start its um, processing. <clears throat> now C is still blocked because, again, only one process at a time can have access to that queue, or to that critical region. Now, eventually B gets done with the critical region, issues a sem signal, which increments the value of the semaphore to zero, indicating that C can now exit the queue and start executing that critical region of code. Finally, when C is done with that critical region, it issues a sem signal, which increments the value of lock to one, indicating that there are no processes currently using the critical region of code. So the biggest thing that we need to worry about when we're implementing semaphores is it's imperative that the sem weight and sem signal operations are implemented as atomic primitives. So what that means is that the operation has to appear to the rest of the system to occur instantaneously. We can't have sem weight and sem signal be things that take multiple instructions to accomplish uh, because we have to worry about, at that point, race conditions and multiple processes stepping on each other. So those have to be atomic operations. Uh, now that can be implemented in hardware or firmware, or we can use software schemes such as Decker's or Peterson's algorithms, although those do incur some overhead. 
So another option is to use a hardware supported scheme for mutual exclusion. So that does it for semaphores. In our next video, we'll take a look at chapter five, section four of your textbook on monitors.